guided to share two things today, one at, both in regards to the vision of this network. Uh, one is to encourage pastors and leaders to experience faith. I believe that's the name of the conference, Experiencing Faith, which is to experience the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives, not just on Sunday, altar ministries and retreats, but in our communities and in our neighborhoods and in our homes. And the second thing is 100 churches in two years. And so I think one of the reasons why Pastor Don invited me to come and my wife to come is so we can share our church planning story. And hopefully in our church planning story, inspire some planters and inspire some uh, senders. My wife and I planted Journey Church in 2016, five and a half years ago. Uh, we started with uh, 17 people on the back porch of a friend's house. And uh, last Sunday, we baptized in one Sunday, 107 people in one Sunday in and out of the water. And Baptism Sunday is my favorite Sunday because you hear the stories. You know, by the way, I don't have a clock here. That's dangerous. Is that, well, somebody, are you my clock? All right. And uh, some of the stories that we've been hearing from the baptism, I think that's why Baptism Sunday is my favorite. We had one uh, young lady who was uh, shot in a drive-by, got into a car accident. She was driving. She got shot in a drive-by while driving by. You can laugh, because she made it. But I'm just saying, if you think you had a bad day, and, uh, and, and through that whole thing, rededicated her life to Christ. She went in and out of the water this past Sunday. The baptism before that, we had a satanic priestess get baptized, come in and out of the water. People she led to Satan. I didn't know that was a thing. People she led, I mean, I guess it would be. So she, people she led to Satan, she invited to the church on Baptism Sunday so she could preach the gospel to them after she came in and out of the water. <laughs> Crazy. Uh, so that's exciting. And in five and a half years, we're excited to report, I think this, with, with what we saw on Easter, I think we had uh, salvations. In five and a half years, we've seen over 2,000 people come to Christ at our church. And that's not just hands raised and you know, usher in the back counting. Those are like names and numbers and addresses and emails. And so it's exciting to see. I, I believe in church planning. I do believe it's the best way to reach people uh, for Jesus. And so, so I had to combine experiencing faith with planting churches. I thought a great title for today's talk would be planting faith, planting faith planting faith. Let me pray for you, and then we'll get into the message today. Father, we love you, and we thank you. We thank you for the Northwest Ministry Network. We thank you for the vision that you've given the leaders. We thank you for every pastor, leader, uh, small group leader, children's director, youth pastor, worship leader in the building, every missionary in the building, God. We ask that what you would do today is plant faith in our hearts, plant faith in our lives. May it be a, a, a move, Lord. May you do something powerful. You know that as I've been preparing and as I've been praying, Lord, my, my prayer for this session is not that we would leave talking about what God did in it, but that years from now, we would be talking about the things God did after it, Lord, that he did in the communities after, the people who, who you raised up after it, Lord, to, to start churches that brought revival uh, to the Pacific Northwest. We love you. In your name we pray. Amen and amen. I believe that the role of the church is to plant faith in the lives of our parishioners. The kind of faith that gets planted on a Sunday and produces fruit on a Monday. I think there is a segment of our population that will never, ever, ever step in a church. And if that is the truth, then that means that we will need a church that is willing to step out. Building a church that steps out. For someone that might be planning a church today, for others that might be sending someone out to start a church, but I think for all of us, that means stepping out into our marketplace, stepping out into our neighborhood, that was my prayer for you last night, you know, that God would stir something in people's hearts. I can't wait to hear the testimonies years from now that what God did through this conference. Planting faith. If I had to define planting faith, and you're taking notes, the first thing I would say is that planting faith is sensitive, but not sensible. Planting faith is sensitive, but not sensible. Before planting faith in the lives of people, you have to make space for the Holy Spirit to plant faith in you. Amen? Acts chapter 9, verse 10 through 17. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias, and the Lord called to him in a vision. Ananias! Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. I love verse 12. I never saw this before, and as I was studying for this message, verse 12 hit me like never before. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Is it just me, or does anyone else find it interesting that Saul of Tarsus had a vision while he was blind? 
a blind man had a vision because sometimes you can see things in the spiritual that you can't see in the natural. And I think when it comes to church planting or when it comes to a call, you've got to see it in your spirit before you see it in your eyes. There are some people you can't see. You know what I'm talking about if you ever tried to get in a building before. You know, you can see the building in your spirit. You just don't see that building with your eyes. You can see the leaders in your spirit, but you can't see those leaders with your eyes. You can see the finances in your spirit, but you can't see the finances uh, in your eyes. You can see that family member who is far from Christ, but you can't see any way (laughs) that person is going to give their life to Christ. you got to be able to live your faith out in a way where just because you can't see it, doesn't mean you can't see it. Amen? Verse 13, Lord Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him much, how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord, Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. What's interesting to me is had Ananias not been sensitive to the spirit, he would have never went to Saul. But had he been sensible, he also would have never went to Saul. Faith exists somewhere between sensitivity and sensibility. You have to be sensitive to the thing that God is asking you to do and yet have the courage to do the thing he asks you to do when the thing he asks you to do doesn't make any sense. Imagine if he had not visited Paul, if he had not reached out to Saul, the impact that we would have missed, that the church would have missed. Um, So I want to share uh, my story on how we got uh, called to to plant. I want to speak on sensitivity and sensibility for a second, but first on sensitivity. Um, The way that I was called, I never wanted to be a a church planter. Um, My wife never wanted to be a, a, a pastor's wife. In fact, when we were dating, we asked all the questions that we needed to ask, and I told her things that I had in my heart, and I told her, was there anything that you would not want to do? in ministry. And she said, I will do anything that God asked me to do. She said, except being a pastor <laughs> or a pastor's wife. I wouldn't do it. God has a sense of humor. And so um, I was at a, a I, was, I worked at Southeastern University as a professor at the time. And we were launching uh, extension sites in churches in the Southeast. And I was in a hotel room after visiting with some pastors. And it was just, it was just a God moment. I was sitting uh, on my bed writing my first book. And in between chapters, I just felt the Holy Spirit rush into that room. And I closed my laptop. I started to weep. I wrote down the word that God gave me. And I just knew in my heart um, that uh, he was calling me to plant a church. I was being sensitive to God in that moment. Now, I need to clarify that being sensitive and being sure are two different things. You know, you can be sensitive and not be sure. In fact, I think if you are sure, it's probably not God. Because I don't know that you can call faith anything that you are 100% about. The opposite of faith is not doubt. The opposite of faith is is a certainty. So I think the the, the, the greatest percentage of certainty that you're allowed to have for it to legally be called faith is like 85%. You can can only be 85% sure that God is asking you. If you're more than 85% sure, uh, it's probably not God or you're probably not dreaming big enough. If 15% of you isn't scared, If 15% of you isn't worried, if 15% of you isn't terrified that what you are going to do is is fail and you're going to mess up life for you and everyone you love, I don't know that that it's it's the Lord. And so I was sensitive, uh, but but I wasn't sure. And so uh, it's important that you know that. And so here's a couple of things when God speaks to you, uh, make sure you confirm it in God's word. Never do something that you felt the Holy Spirit ask you that the word of God does not validate or confirm. Never walk, in, never walk into your workplace and just slap somebody because the Holy Spirit told you to. <laughs> and then when you do that, you're like, well, the Bible said, Psalms, you know, break the teeth of the wicked, Lord. And well, that's the Lord's job to break the teeth. You pray for them, the Lord will break the teeth. Um, but uh, 
Don't, don't do anything the Bible doesn't say. And are you ready for this? Don't pray too long about doing things the Bible already gave you permission to do. Some of the stuff we pray about, I'm like, it's in the Bible. You're good to go. You can do it. I remember when before we planted the church, we had to uh, choose between, I got offered a position at the national office, and at the same time, I got offered a position uh, at Southeastern. And uh, I was stuck because I really loved the local church, so I didn't know what to do. And I met with my pastor, and uh, he said, yeah, you know, um, he, he really simplified it for me. He said, so, so either go to the national office and, and serve God. I was like, yeah. He's like, what's your other choice? It's like, go to Lakeland and serve God. He was like, okay, so your choices are serve God or serve God. And I'm like, I feel like you just Jedi mind tricked <laughs> right there. And uh, he said, I think you're overcomplicating it. I think if you serve God, that's the main thing, that you serve God. And so we served in Lakeland for two years before God called us to plant. The position that was offered to me at the national office, I can say this now because Pastor Doug's not here, but the position that was offered to me at the national office two years after it was offered to me was dissolved. In two years, I was going to shift regardless of the decision that I had made. Isn't that cool how God works? He was going to get you to where he was going to get you regardless. Don't overpray his purpose over your life if it aligns with God's word. I think that's important. And so, and also what I did with him was important because I think you also want to um, run by what God tells you with other people, beginning with your lead pastor. Do that. Uh, make sure that you confirm it with, with them. I, I did that with our pastor. Make sure you confirm it. Remember the verse in, in the book of Acts, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. So there should be some confirmation around you. Make sure your spouse is on board with it as well. I think that's a significant person in your life to really lock down. I think if you don't do that, and so God had to speak to me and to my wife. And we, tra we train church planners, and I get real nervous when I'm at a table training a church planner, and, and the, the husband or the wife, whoever really felt the call, and the other spouse is not really supportive. I, I get flags. They all go up inside of me. Can I just be candid? Um, if your wife doesn't believe in you, <laughs> here's, what I, here's what I really mean. Here, you, might, you need to hear this, church planner, if you're thinking, she might know something about you that you're unwilling to believe about yourself. Then maybe that's not your seat on the bus. Then maybe you're a great number two, but not a number one. Listen to her. Listen to him. They're in your, they know you too. They, it, sometimes it's not always lack faith. Sometimes they just know who they're married to. Come on, somebody. And that's okay. And that's okay. This is where I get in trouble. Hopefully I don't get in trouble, but that's okay. You need to know that. And so I needed the Lord to speak to my wife in our church planning journey. And so I told, and I needed the Lord to do that. So when he spoke to me, um, I held it in my heart for probably five or six months and I didn't say anything to her because my wife, she's ride or die, my wife. If I had told her that the Lord told me to plant a church, she'd be like, I'm in, let's go. But it couldn't be me that would be the one to convince her. Because if I convince her and it fails, <laughs> then it's my fault. <laughs> so I just told the Lord, I need it to come from her so that if it fails, we could both blame you. I mean, praise you, Lord. We could both praise you. We could both praise you. Both praise you. And so I had to be her. And so my wife's, the, my wife's story, the way she was called to plant a church was different. My wife didn't get called in a hotel room. She got called at a gas station. My wife is at a gas station. And one thing you need to know about uh, my wife, is she's one of the most generous people you will ever meet, okay? If you need money, she's going to hook it up. So don't ask. Um, so she was at a gas station, and, and this, this, this man came by. I wasn't there, or else this man would never came by. But this man came by, and he, said, he came up to her. He said, he said ma'am, can you help me by putting gas in my car? I need some gas for my, for my car. And uh, Liz is so generous. She said, absolutely, take me to your car. I'll fill it up. So she went over to the car. And uh, she filled up the gas tank. As she filled up the gas tank, she looked in the back seat, and there was uh, this man. His name was John, by the way. She looked. In, he looked in the back. She looked in the back seat. My wife, and there was a woman and a baby in pillows and blankets. So my wife asked, "Is everything okay?" And it turns out that John, her name was Rita. John had just got released from prison. Rita picked him up, and the one thing that she owned, that car, they were living out of their car, had no job, had no place to stay. Um, my wife invited uh, them to church, the church that we were youth pastors at, and invited, uh, could we pray with them? And so she prayed with them. Um, John felt the Holy Spirit right there, started ministering him. He started to cry right there at the gas station. My wife starts crying. Um, there was no invitation for the gospel at that moment, just prayer. And the next Sunday, I happened to be preaching at our church. Now, you know, the youth pastor doesn't always get the big stage, but that Sunday, I got the big stage. 
And as I'm getting ready to preach, who walks in right after I get introduced, but John and Rita and their baby. John and Rita walk in, my wife sees them, they sit right in the front. And, uh, and I'm preaching to a, a church of however many people, but I'm looking right at John and Rita. And, uh, and at the end of the message, when we go to present the gospel and offer people to make a decision for Christ, John and Rita raise their hand and they give their life to Jesus. And I sit back down and that for her and I, that was both the first. Growing up in church, we had seen a lot of people backslide to Jesus. You know what I'm talking about, youth pastors? You know, like they go away, but they kind of grew up in church, but then they come back years later. That was the first time we had ever seen someone go from zero God knowledge. John did not know who Jesus was, period. From zero God knowledge to I believe it and I'm ready to give him the rest of my life. We'd never seen that before. So then she looks over at me. She's crying, I'm crying. And actually I'm holding in the tears because you know. And she looks at me. But then when she said this, that's when I started crying. She goes, wouldn't it be crazy? If there was a church, she said the word, and these words became the mission statement of our church. She said, where Jesus could be accessible to anyone. I was like, are you saying? <laughs> are you saying you, are you saying you want to start a church? She's like, I think so. I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, it, was just, it was one of those moments where God aligned both of our lives. Now, here's the important part. God called me in a hotel room. God called her at a gas station. Ready? The Holy Spirit will nudge you in two ways. When you get in the presence of God and when you get in the presence of pain. Huh? When you get into God's presence, he can speak to you. But when you see a hurting person or a hurting city or a hurting demographic or a, hurt, a hurting part of society or a, 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 a hurting whoever, God can speak to you in those moments too. And so it's very important, hear me really carefully, that we do not grow numb to God's presence, first and foremost. Do not grow callous to the supernatural voice of the Holy Spirit. I, I grew up in a church that was Pentecostal, super Pentecostal. What does that mean? Spanish Pentecostal. That's what that means, okay? I couldn't just invite friends to church. I had to know who was preaching first. And if the wrong person was preaching, there needed to be an orientation <laughs> before I could invite a friend to church. Listen, a lot of us grew up in churches like that, and, and it's okay to say, didn't have the best experiences. Sometimes we were hurt or harmed by what was meant to help us. And in an effort to right that wrong, we swung to the other side of the pendulum and abandoned the supernatural voice of the Holy Spirit altogether. We got callous in an effort to protect our hearts from spiritual abuse and lost spirituality in one shot. Don't abandon it, balance it. Balance it. Don't just make Jesus accessible, make the Holy Spirit accessible. Make the Holy Spirit accessible to people in your church and in your community. And so Pastor John just put the counter away and said, go for it. <laughs> Good, because I got three more points, brother. Um, just. <laughs> You got you to gotta make, make space for it. Don't grow callous to it. And ready? And don't get used to it either. Listen, you can get used to God's goodness. You can get used to God's character. You can get used to God fulfilling his promises. But don't get ever used. Don't ever get used to his presence. Don't ever get used to the power of the Holy Spirit. Don't ever get used to a worship song. And you can just let those tears flow in God's presence. Lest you fall like Moses fell, who when God asked him to speak to the stone, he struck it because he was used to... God speaking a certain way that when God gave him a new direction, he missed it completely because he was used to speaking in a certain way, frame and shape. Don't ever get used to it. Don't go callous to the presence of God. And hear me, don't grow callous to people's pain. You almost have to in the society that we live in today where every time you open up your social media, there's another tragedy. There's another war. There's another variation of the pandemic. It's called compassion fatigue. And so we almost have to protect our mind and our hearts from the, from the weight of everything that we see and, and so that we can make it through our day and make it through life. But I don't know that God asked us to live life that way. Now, now not everything can break your heart or else you just won't get through the day, right? You, can't, you just can't, not everything can break your heart. You just like, oh, cats, oh my God. Oh, yeah, like, uh. But here's the question you have to ask yourself. Ready? 
Here's the question you have to ask yourself, what breaks your heart? John Maxwell said, I was a pastor until my publisher told me that more businessmen were buying my books than church leaders. He said, in that moment, my heart broke for business leaders and he shifted the trajectory of his ministry. What is your pain point? Who do you hurt for? Who do you hurt for? Uh, millennials, Gen Z, Latin Americans, African Americans, who do you hurt for? The LGBTQ community, who do you hurt for? The unchurched, those who grew up in church, what nation do you hurt for? America, Ecuador, what, do, what, what breaks your heart? Whatever breaks your heart, ask yourself, does this break the heart of God? And if it breaks God's heart and it breaks your heart, God might be leading you somewhere to do something. Don't grow numb to God's pain. So you gotta be sensitive but don't be sensible at the same time. I'm gonna be very frank about our church planning story. This part, um, I'm not ashamed of. It's just the way our story went. Um, we were not sent out by our pastor. Now that's, I, that's not a problem because at least we were not cast out. Come on, somebody. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of ways to go. You could be sent out, you could be cast out. Don't be cast out. We weren't cast out. We were, we were called out. And the reason why we were not cast out and we were not sent out, we were called out. What does that mean? He gave us the blessing, but there was no financial support. There was no people support. And there was a don't ask anybody to come. And it was not his fault. He's my mentor to this day, love him so much. We hung out not that long ago. Um, it was a bad time for the church. But when I shared my heart with him, I laid it all out what God wanted me to do. And then he said, okay, okay, well, you won't be able to do this, you won't be able to do that, you won't be able to do that. And they said, and I need one more year of your employment here before you go. And without hesitation, we said, yes, absolutely. Because the way you leave one season will determine the way you enter into the next. And so you gotta make sure, and I knew that one day I would pastor and someone would sit me in my office and share the dream and the vision that God had in their heart. So I needed to sow seeds today that were gonna reap fruit in that time. Now that was not sensible because when you've got excitement and you've got passion and if you're a young leader, you know what that's like, you wanna go and you wanna run and you got all the, we had, you know, we had already got the, the uh, <laughs> we had the name thing in the Florida registry thing. We got the name thing and all that stuff and all that stuff. And so now that's away in the corner. We're not gonna look at that for a year. And, uh, but you know what? I'm so glad that he asked me that and that my wife and I had the faith to do the unsensible thing because we were gonna launch in August of that year. And in August, um, our third son was born, Journey Joseph Vasquez, who passed away seven hours after he was born. Had I, had I disregarded the request of my pastor, I would have lost a child at this three weeks before the church was gonna launch. Without a doubt in my mind, I know the church would have failed. Sometimes we look to open doors for God's will, but we can just as easily look to the closed doors. Sometimes rejection is really just redirection. And so follow the nose sometimes. They'll lead you to God's will. It also wasn't sensible because we didn't have any money and we didn't have any people and we were moving to a city we never lived at, <laughs> ever lived in. So I told my wife, I said, is it cool if we cash out our retirement account? Because that's the only way we're gonna do it. She said, yeah, let's do it. I said, is it cool if we sell our house? Because God spoke to her. You see how this works? <laughs> see how this works? So, so, so we sold, so we sold our, our house. We cashed out our retirement account. I told her, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to have to quit all my jobs to do it. I have three jobs at the time. I was working as a professor at Southeast University. I was a traveling evangelist. And I was a youth pastor. I had to quit all three. And uh, we were making six figures with all of those incomes together. I had never gotten into ministry to make that much money before. Um, and, uh, and the moment I did... Uh, <laughs> And she said, absolutely. She only asked for one thing, my wife. She said, absolutely, we can do it, as long as we get to keep our Disney passes. <laughs> so the joke is, we didn't have health insurance for three years. <laughs> but we had Disney passes. <laughs> yes, we did. Yes, we did. Come on. Mickey was my therapist. Mickey was my physician. <laughs> Mickey was my, he was all of it. Praise the Lord. It's not sensible. Faith often doesn't make sense. But we had to do those things because hear me about planning faith because planning faith is not just the faith you have, but a faith you have to show. It's amazing how many things we believe 
until belief requires sacrifice. At that moment, we really know what we believe and what we don't believe. Come on, have you ever heard the story of the tight roper? The tight roper? That's not how you, the tight rope walker? The famous tight rope? You've heard that story, Pastor Don? The, you'll find out. He's a tight rope walker and a real famous dude. He, he did back and forth over Niagara Falls. Yeah. And then, and then he had to make it more exciting every time that he had, he did it with a wheelbarrow. He, he did it on stilts. And then one day to get the people to come back, he said, I got the stunt that's going to blow your mind. Everybody was like, what is it? He was like, how many people think I can walk across Niagara Falls with a person on my back? Everybody said, yeah, we believe. He says, cool. I just need a volunteer. <laughs> just one volunteer. Because a lot of people believe in, but few believe on. Fewer people, to, few people are willing to put their life on the line when God calls them. Our faith sermons are good, but our faith stories are even better. When you step out of the four walls and live church in your community, and you get to come back to your church with the stories that you, that you, how you lived out the gospel in your community, that, those stories from our early church days still inspire our church today. But now I got to be sure that I'm not just living on yesterday's stories. Now I got to create new stories Every day, live a life of faith outside that encourages and inspires people. So you got to be a display, you got to display that faith really quickly. You got to show, show three things. You got to show what it means to be gospel centered. Paul just preached the gospel. First Corinthians chapter two, verse one through five. And so it was with me, brothers and sisters, when I came to you, I did not come with eloquence or human wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God, for I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came to you in weakness, with great fear and trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with what? With a demonstration of the Spirit's power. Not, not, a, not a declaration of the Spirit's power a demonstration of the Spirit's power so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. Faith without deeds are dead and sermons without demonstrations are dead too. At some point, we gotta tell people what God's doing in our life so that they can be inspired to go do it in their own. So show what it means to be gospel-centered. I, I get the temptation sometimes as a preacher to preach messages for felt needs and, and, and preach messages that I know are gonna get people gonna like and people are gonna say amen to, but, but I never, you can't ever stop preaching Jesus. You can't ever stop preaching the gospel. You gotta make sure that in every message, Jesus is the center. Jesus born, Jesus lived, Jesus died, Jesus resurrected, Jesus is coming back again. Jesus is always and always about Jesus. And if you get tired of preaching Jesus, beware. Most people who get tired of preaching Jesus are just a couple days away of getting tired of following Jesus. If you do not wake up every morning absolutely humbled by the fact that you are a sinner saved by grace. The best preachers are the ones who know that they were the worst sinners. Paul, at the end of his ministry, huh? The chief of sinners. First he said, I was the least uh, of the apostles. Then later on, he said, I was the least of all Christians. And then second, in Timothy, right before he passed away, he goes, I'm the, I'm the worst of all sinners. I'm like, what's going on in Paul's life? <laughs> just going the opposite direction. I just think the longer you're in this, the more you realize you don't deserve it. You don't deserve it. Sinner saved by grace, man. Show what it means to be presence filled. Presence filled. Presence filled. I'm gonna make this really quick. When you step into a room, does the presence of God fill it or does stress and anxiety fill it? Does worry fill it? Does doubt fill it? Be presence filled. And then lastly, show what it means to be purpose driven. Purpose driven, purpose driven. What's happening in the building is important but uh, it cannot be the driving force of your ministry. It cannot be the driving force of your ministry. We were uh, portable for four and a half years, which was great because it, it made us get into the community when we were a portable church. Uh, we were at a local school and we were able to have an impact in that local school. Um, so much so that when a high school a senior got into a bullying incident um, that went wrong and died, our principal called us to host the funeral for the student. The same principal who didn't want anything to do with us was happy that we were there knew he could turn to us when he needed us because we were there. Uh, so four and a half years. But how many people know four and a half years of pipe and drape can get old? Real quick. Raise your hand if you, if you are not pipe and drape life right now. Come on, somebody. Uh, pipe and drape can get old. And for four and a half years, uh, and then COVID hit. Now, if you were portable during COVID, you could look at that as a good thing or a bad thing. It's a good thing because I ain't got no mortgage. 
So you can't meet and I can't meet, except you're paying not to meet. <laughs> I'm not meeting for free. You know what I'm saying? I'm not meeting and it's not costing me. <laughs> That's awesome. But during COVID, we changed our venue uh, five times uh, because we just had no place to meet five times. And at the very end, this venue opened up and it was uh, 97,000 square feet. It was an old arena um, and it was scheduled for demolition. The owner was going to demolish it and build a casino and luxury apartments that were around the casino. But the same owner who owned the property owned like 86% of like the malls in like the Southeastern America, which malls was a bad business to be in since 1990, but also <laughs> since, also, also post 2020. So, so he, he, ready, he had this property, but he didn't have the money to develop it. Okay, follow along. So, so, he, so I, he reaches out to us and he goes, hey, um, would you guys be willing to lease this property out? Full disclosure, all we need is a vote from the county. If we get the vote from the county to legalize gambling in this space, this building will come down. So we're gonna sign a three-year lease with a one-year option, and the option's mine. Not mine, mine, me, I'm the owner. The option is the owner. So if after one year, we get the vote, then you guys gotta go, because we're gonna demolish it. So I didn't know what to do. <laughs> I was really nervous about it, uh, because it wasn't a building that was ready to go. We were gonna have to put in at least $300,000 into renovating it, and uh, that $300,000 is a lot of money to put in something, and you're not guaranteed to have it back. Uh, so we got a little creative with the lease. We like, you know, if, if we do it, would you be willing to reimburse our, our, our what well, we put in the investment of the refurbishing and all that? Would you be down with that? He was like, yeah, we'll do that. That was pretty cool. Um, but also still to be in the building for a little bit of time and not knowing. So I got real nervous about it, prayed about it, and uh, God showed me this scripture, and I'd never seen it this way before. And worship team, you can come up because we're not, not going to stay much longer here. Matthew 27, when Jesus, and I know this verse doesn't sound like it goes, but I promise it goes. I promise it goes. I was thinking about building, 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 building. This is good for anybody who's portable. This is good for anybody who's permanent. This is good for anybody who wants to plant a church but doesn't know how they're gonna do it without a building. Hear me. When Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he yielded up his spirit. Verse 51, and at that moment, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth quaked and the rocks were split. I'm so glad I'm preaching to preachers because I don't have to get into the whole symbolism behind the veil and everything like that. I can skip all that and just get to the revelation. Here's the revelation God told me. He goes, you've been trying to get into a building for four and a half years, but for thousands of years, I've been trying to get out of one. For thousands of years, I was hidden behind a veil. And for thousands of years, I've been trying to get out. It's not about the building, JJ. I came, I came out so that I could go meet sinners where they were, so that I could go meet people where they were. When, I, when that hit me, when that revelation hit me, I thought, then that means that if, if you did it without a building, then we don't need a building, that the church is not a building, that it's the purpose and it's the people and it's the impact that we make and the difference that we make. So I signed that contract. <laughs> So if the veil was torn and, the, and Jesus did it, then maybe the building will go down and Jesus will do it. And, and I don't know, but I signed it. I signed it. I signed it. <laughs> and I was so scared when I signed it. And then we started spending money. And if you've ever been in a building project, you know three things about a building project, okay? It'll take longer than you think. It'll be more expensive than you think. I don't know what the third thing was, but those two things you'll know about a building project. The third thing is, oh, I know what the third thing is. Yeah, because this is what a mentor told me. The third thing is, you are not the exception, <laughs> even though you think you are, which is true. Because the moment they told me that, I was like, I'm the exception, and I wasn't. <laughs> I'm the exception, I wasn't. So I said, so we got in the building. But here's what I told our staff. I said, listen, if we're going to get in this building, and we're going to lose this building in a year, then we're going to use this year to be purpose-driven as a church. We're going to use this year to impact the community in such a way that if he ever needed to leave, that the community in one year would rise up and fight for our presence here in this community. 
And so I told that to our youth pastor. I told that to our children's pastor. I told that to our outreach team. And so we started doing it. We started ministering to the homeless like never before. We started, uh, we wrote a $30,000 check to our local elementary school. And we don't got money like that, just so you know. It's not like, and that was 1% of the budget. Like, no, this is $30,000. $30,000. <laughs> $30, we gave it to the principal. They didn't have um, a library in their school. It was completely outdated. All the computers were old. We renovated the entire computer lab for our local elementary school, like three blocks down from the school. Um, we had people from the community start visiting uh, the church. We had the president of the HOA in that time visit, uh, just letting us know the stuff that we were doing in the community is making an impact. So, so a month ago, they have the county vote. A month ago, they have the county vote. And, and, and we pass our March, March 1st, so not a month ago. Two months ago. March 1st, we pass our date on the lease because we signed in March 1, 2021. So now it's the year. At any moment, we can be bought out now of our, of our option. And, uh, and, and we're nervous because we don't know what's going what's gonna to happen. There's five county commissioners. And I don't know how government works. Uh, but <laughs> I assume if there's millions of dollars involved in a property, I don't know. There's some unscrupulous things probably happening scrupulous. I've never said that word before in a sentence. But I feel like that was the right time to say unscrupulous. And uh, all they needed was three out of the five county commissioners. So my wife and I are watching the, the proceeding on TV because they're streaming it. And because um, I can't go because I can't because he's my landlord. So I can't be like, leave us here. Because <laughs> then it's going to be like, you're gone, right? So you got to be wise about it. You got to be wise. So, so I stay back. People were like, can we go? I was like, if you want to go. <laughs> so anyway, so the developer had a bunch of people lined up to testify. This is going to be good for the community. It's going to bring jobs. And then, and then when they were done, a bunch of people started speaking. And we were starting to get testimonies and emails and references. What will happen to the church? If it goes, voter after voter after voter after voter after voter after voter. Some of them did not go to our church. Some of them were not Christians. Some of them belonged to the LGBTQ community. Some of them were Muslims. Some of them were atheists. After voter after voter said, we want the church to stay. They needed three out of the five commissioners. My wife are watching the vote. Like I've never been so involved in county <laughs> politics ever in my life. My wife and I are watching the vote, and it's hand, 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 unanimous. The church stays because of the voters. <laughs> I started crying. I came back to our staff. I came back to our staff, and I said, we wanted to build the church. We said in one year, you remember, guys? They said, yeah, in one year, we would build a church that the community would fight for because we made the community our focus. So now the landlord can't build his casino. Um, but we're still on that buyout lease. <laughs> so at any moment, he can kick us out of the building. So uh, next month, we're going to try and put an offer on a building uh, that is not for sale with money we don't have. <laughs> I can't wait to come back next year and tell you what God does. I'm just inviting myself. That's rude. I didn't... <laughs> Sorry about that, Pastor Don, but it's not sensible, but it's, I think it's God. I think it's Jesus. We're going to pray in just a second. Here's my last thing. Listen, planning faith doesn't push for results, but praise for rain. But praise for rain. Praise for rain. First Kings 8, 35, 36. People ask me what I would do differently if I got the chance to plant my church over again, and I tell them the same thing every time. And they don't like my answer because I think they're looking for something strategic. My answer is always the same. If I were to plant all over again, I would pray more. I underestimated the spiritual weight of being a church planter. I thought I could get by with creative sermon illustrations and, and, and great social media presence. And my heart was not ready for the weight of, uh, of leading a church like that. I would pray more. Verse 35 to 36, 1 Kings 8. When the heavens are shut up and there is no rain because your people have sinned against you, and when they pray toward this place and give praise to your name and turn from their sin because you have afflicted them, then hear from heaven and forgive the sin of your servants, your people Israel, 
teach them the right way to live, hear me, and send rain on the Pacific Northwest. 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 We can't do it without you, Holy Spirit. Send rain on the Pacific Northwest. We're not gonna just push for the results and fight for the numbers, but if you send rain, Lord God, rain, it will come, it will come, it will come, it will come. It will come, it will come. When it comes to rain, wait, on, wait, wait for the rainy season. We gotta wait on the season. Don't rush into church planting. I don't like that we call it launching a church. The only thing you launch are rockets. It's funny, but it's true. Churches don't get launched. They get planted. I don't like the name because it sets this expectation of if I don't launch with 500 people on day one, then I failed. You're planting. Planting starts small and it grows big. It's you got to plant. So wait for the right season. Senders and planters. Wait for the right season. If your pastor asks you to hold off, wait. You don't know what wisdom is behind those words, what God is speaking to them. Senders, wait. I know, I know, you, I know you've charged it by the vision, but God's going to send you the right person at the right time to get you. So wait for that person. Don't be desperate. That person will come. That delay spared my ministry. When it comes to rain, you got to transfer the pressure. I was joking in my last session. I was like, are there any farmers in the room? And then there was two farmers in the room. I was like, I got to be careful now. <laughs> you see how preachers are. We're Google smart. You know, We talk about stuff we have no idea, but we Googled it. So <laughs> you know what it is, preachers? They're like, let me talk to you about the rotation of Mars. We don't know nothing about no Mars. We Googled it. We spent five minutes. But then there's somebody in church who like, visited Mars, and it's like, that's actually not how Mars works. You're like, sorry, I was the Bible. I'm a pastor, you know? <laughs> so I was like, I got to get my farming stuff down pat. But I was like, so when, when I found out there were two farmers in the room, I was like, all right, correct me if I'm wrong. But I bet you, like, the hardest thing about farming is not planting the seeds. I bet you the hardest thing about farming is hoping that it rains. Because what really grows the seed is the rain. And so if, this, if what really grows the seed is the rain, then hear me, then stop putting undue pressure on your seed and start transferring that pressure to the rain. God will do it. God can do it. You cannot carry the weight of growing your ministry. You cannot carry the weight of, of reaching all these people. You cannot carry that weight. Put that weight on the shoulders of the one who carried the weight of the world on his shoulders. Put that weight on Jesus. Transfer that pressure. By the way, if you don't transfer the pressure, you'll take the praise. Huh? I remember one time I was, I was in Bible college and there was a, a, a guy in a wheelchair. His name was Mr. Darrell. He was a college star, athlete. One day, his frat pushed him outside of a window. He ended up being paralyzed for the rest of his life. It was a prank gone wrong. But he was a board member at the church that I was serving at. And one day, we just got all full of faith, and we just surrounded Mr. Darrell's wheelchair. We laid hands on his legs. And in the name of Jesus, we just prayed. Now, this story does not end with Mr. Darrell getting out of the wheelchair. I hate to disappoint you. We prayed in faith. And then and nothing happened. Mr. Darrell stood in that wheelchair, and this, this young girl who was next to me started crying, started crying, started crying. She said, I'm sorry, Mr. Darrell. I'm sorry that I didn't have the faith to get you out that wheelchair. Mr. Darrell said, if you're willing to take the blame, you would have been willing to take the credit. I love what you said when you honored the, the pastors, the 23% that didn't make it. You gave them a coin, not because they succeeded by, you know, by, by popular church standards succeeded, but they succeeded because they were obedient and faithful. Can we redefine success as a community today and say, here's winning, being obedient. Here's winning, doing what God says. And then let's put the pressure for the results back on Jesus. Back on Jesus. Well done, good and successful servant. That's not how it is in your Bible. That's not how it is in your Bible. Well done, good and successful servant. Well done, good and faithful servant, faithful servant, faithful servant. We need the rain. Would you do me uh, the honor, the courtesy of standing to our feet for just a moment? I'm not going to ask you to come front, but right there, 
in your seat. Would you bow your head, close your eyes, and if you're willing, would you extend your hands like this, just in a posture of, of receiving, in a posture of receiving. Here's my prayer today, and the worship team will take us away. My prayer is, we've got church planners, we've got church plant senders. We've got people who are great communicators. We've got people who are great team builders. We've got people who are creative beyond belief. They can do a lot with a website and the logos and graphics. And we've got people who are great at small groups and great at children's ministry. None of us can do it without the rain. Not without the rain. So all over this room, and I love preaching to preachers because I don't have to push you. It's in you. In your own words, for your own city and your own church, would you ask the Lord for the rain right now? You know, you can't do it by yourself. You know, you can't do it alone. Come on. We talked about signing your name to it. I dare you to pray that prayer out loud. Sign your name to that prayer right now. Send rain in my heart. Send rain on my heart. God gave me the vision last night where we prayed for church planners, we prayed for leaders. That was last night. And now we understand we can't accomplish that without the help of the Holy Spirit. We cannot accomplish that without the outpouring, without an outpouring of God's presence. So right there, come on, would you ask the Lord for those campuses starting in Hawaii and those campuses starting in Alaska and those campuses starting in Idaho and those campuses starting in Seattle and, and starting in Spokane. Come on, we need rain. We need rain. We are living in a day and age that if God does not do it, it shall not get done. We don't have it. Here's what I love about church planners. Church planners say, I don't got the money. I don't got the talent. I'm not charismatic. I've never been used in a supernatural way before. Then you are a prime candidate for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Empty cups are the best cup. Empty cups are the cups that get filled the easiest. Empty cups are the ones that catch the rain. Empty cups are the ones that receive the rain. Father, we receive your presence today. We receive your presence today. Come on, pastor. Come on, leader. Come on, press in for God's presence. Press in for God's power. And I believe right now there are some sensitivity that's taking place. There are some nonsensical things that are being deposited in your heart. God, give us the faith, Lord, to act on these dreams. Give us the faith to act on these visions. Holy Spirit, we need you.